17. Viviana Ross While working as a waitress at London celebrity hotspot Chilton Firehouse in 2017, 21-year-old aspiring model and actress Viviana Ross had a steamy tryst with actor Orlando Bloom. She lost her job when her bosses found her naked in bed inside Bloom's hotel room during his week-long stay at the luxury hotel and restaurant. Ross was also dropped from a modeling gig with a bridal magazine after the incident made news headlines, and she later claimed that agents had started to essentially avoid her like the plague. At the time, Bloom and his longtime partner, American singer Katy Perry, were on a break. A year after the incident, Ross told reporters that she was struggling to find a job and that most employers were unwilling to hire her. By then, Bloom and Katy Perry had started dating again, leaving Ross feeling as though Bloom had left her high and dry by failing to defend her or her career more vocally. Speaking with The Sun, she complained about how she'd lost so much while Bloom didn't lose anything. In fact, she said the incident only bolstered his image. Ross wasn't completely without work opportunities, however. She was offered placement on several reality shows, including Big Brother and Made in Chelsea. But she turned the roles down and criticized the industry and society in general for treating women more harshly than men when it comes to their personal lives. In her own words, Ross told The Sun, Women are just put in a box. I just have a stamp on my forehead. I lost a lot of credibility with various designers and agencies. She went on to say that these skewed gender dynamics make her angry, which is arguably understandable because it's the 21st century and women are still fighting not to be discriminated against. 16. Jonathan Lowe As a reporter for Phoenix-based news station KPHO, 33-year-old Jonathan Lowe's workplace consisted of the entire community and public sphere. In May of 2016, he was accused of defecating on someone's front lawn near the subject of his assigned story's home. A neighbor who was retrieving her morning newspaper claimed to see Lowe leaning against the house while in the middle of the act. According to police, Lowe admitted to relieving himself outdoors. He reportedly said, I know what you want to talk to me about. I've been feeling very sick and I've been stuck in this van all day. The reporter accused the people who called the police on him of just wanting to start problems. But at the same time, it's understandable that someone called the authorities considering the disturbing nature of what they'd witnessed. Moreover, the woman who'd made the call said that she would have been happy to let Lowe use her bathroom if he'd just asked. Lowe was fired from his job and was also charged with public defecation, which can carry a fine of up to $2,500 and up to six months in jail. While the outcome of the case is unclear, it's likely safe to assume that he no longer works in television. 15. Linda Haddad A Florida criminal defense attorney named Linda Haddad grossly overstepped the boundary that most professionals draw between their work and their personal life in 2016 when she was disbarred for having illicit encounters and using drugs with her clients. According to court documents, the 43-year-old's pattern of misconduct included allegations of inappropriate intimate relationships with at least two clients who were being detained at the Volusia County Jail. Haddad also reportedly engaged in steamy phone calls with the individuals she was representing, which were recorded by the jail. And during questioning, she allegedly admitted to kissing one of her jailed boyfriends during a visit to the facility. The allegations against the wayward attorney also included running late for hearings, neglecting certain clients' cases, and failing to respond when authorities began investigating the complaints against her. Additionally, court documents state that in 2013, Hadid filed a motion to modify the sentence of an inmate she was intimate with, whom she wasn't representing at the time. In August of 2015, police attempted to stop her dad in Daytona Beach for an expired tag. But instead of pulling over, she led law enforcement on a high-speed chase, and a police helicopter was brought in to help track her. The pursuit finally ended with the use of stop sticks, which disabled her dad's vehicle. In addition to losing her license to practice law, she pleaded no contest in criminal court to driving with a suspended or revoked license and fleeing or attempting to elude with lights or sirens active. In the end, the judge found her dad guilty and ordered her to complete a 90-day inpatient behavioral health program. 
2014, Rebecca Conrad. In 2022, a US Postal Service worker named Rebecca Conrad was arrested twice for allegedly driving drunk on the job. During the first incident, the 48-year-old crashed her mail truck into the garage door of a residence in Chesterton, Indiana. She denied drinking any alcohol that day, but responding officers found seven mini bottles of banana-flavored liquor in her purse, and her blood alcohol level was twice the legal limit for driving. Conrad pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor operating while intoxicated OWI charge, and received a 60-day suspended sentence as a result. She was also ordered to perform five days of community service, lost her driver's license for a month, and was required to undergo a substance abuse evaluation. According to court documents, she was sentenced to six months of probation on top of her other consequences. Just five months after her sentencing, however, Conrad was arrested again for allegedly driving her mail truck under the influence. This time, a Porter County resident called the police after seeing her fall out of the vehicle as it veered off the road. When a responding officer found Conrad lying on the road with multiple injuries, she reportedly claimed that she'd suffered a seizure while driving. But the officer observed several telltale signs of intoxication, including an odor of alcohol on the woman's breath and watery bloodshot eyes. Comrade's blood alcohol level tested at 0.336, more than four times the legal limit, and more than twice what it had been during her first OWI arrest. As a result, she was charged with multiple crimes, including felony OWI with a prior conviction within seven years. Court documents show that Conrad pleaded guilty to the OWI charge as part of a plea deal in exchange for the dismissal of three misdemeanor charges. She served a short jail sentence, but it's unclear whether she still works for the Postal Service. 13. Crystal Burrell New York City's infamous Rikers Island Jail has long faced allegations of deplorable living conditions, corruption, and nefarious activity among both inmates and employees. The maximum security institution, which houses around 6,000 detainees, is on track to close by 2027 due to several smaller jails throughout the city's various boroughs. In the meantime, officials are left with no choice but to run the notorious facility as smoothly as possible, which is proving to be a huge challenge. In one of the many cases of employee corruption that have made news headlines in recent years, a 36-year-old former corrections officer named Crystal Burrell smuggled contraband into the jail in exchange for $10,000 in bribes from an inmate and Blunt Street gang member named Terry Hines. According to authorities, Burrell snuck narcotics, cell phones, and other items into the facility for Hines, who resold the illicit goods at a large profit while detained on a gun charge in connection to a shooting. During a search of Hines' cell in 2021, law enforcement found a cell phone that appeared to belong to Burrell. Further investigation revealed the extent of the guard's involvement with the inmate. Burrell initially denied smuggling a cell phone into the jail for Hines, but later confessed to doing so, claiming that she was threatened with a weapon. She and Hines were arrested on federal bribery charges, but it didn't stop the wayward guard from allegedly conspiring to smuggle contraband into the detention facility that Hines was transferred to after he was removed from Rikers. They both ended up pleading guilty to federal bribery charges, and in 2023, Burrell was sentenced to 29 months in prison. Based on the most recent available updates on the case, Hines is currently awaiting sentencing. 12. Hyun W. Lee Hyun W. Lee, also known as Michael Lee, made a living as a real estate attorney in Queens, New York. But apparently, he lived outside his means and had a penchant for gambling and to fund his lifestyle, he defrauded his clients out of millions of dollars in escrow funds that he used for personal expenses. In addition to spending the money on his gambling habit, Lee allegedly used the funds to pay expenses for a restaurant that he partially owned. According to the US Justice Department, he specifically targeted members of the Korean American community. And even after being suspended and disbarred, he continued posing as a licensed attorney. By the time authorities took criminal action against Lee, he drained the escrow account from over $3 million down to just $25,000.
At this point, he'd failed to honor his client's request to have their funds released from escrow. To buy time, he allegedly claimed that he was trying to situate an equitable way to distribute the payments. In December 2023, Lee took a plea deal in federal court and admitted to one count of wire fraud. He agreed to forfeit $3.27 million and is facing up to 20 years in prison. As of January 2024, he's awaiting sentencing. 11. Kimberly Barnes If you pay as much attention to the news as most people, you probably notice that there's unfortunately no shortage of teachers who make headlines for allegedly committing crimes on the job. In one recent case out of Grovetown, Georgia, a 29-year-old middle school science teacher named Kimberly Barnes was accused of stealing a fellow teacher's credit card in neighboring South Carolina, using it to buy $62 in gas and $25 in pizza. According to Edgefield County Sheriff Jody Rowland, the accused theft happened in early 2022. Barnes was allegedly captured making the purchases on surveillance video, and her phone number was connected with the pizza order that was paid for with the stolen card. At the time, she was working at a middle school in the area. When confronted by the victim and a local deputy, she reportedly denied committing the theft even after being shown the security footage. She was placed on administrative leave while an investigation was carried out, and when law enforcement went to arrest her, they found her home abandoned. Police caught up with Barnes in Georgia in November of 2023 when they discovered the outstanding warrant during a traffic stop. She was extradited to South Carolina, where she quickly bonded out and was released. In the meantime, the school in Georgia where she was working at the time of her arrest sent a letter out to parents informing them of the pending criminal case. The school's principal reassured the public that the allegations were being taken extremely seriously and that a substitute teacher had been appointed to fill in for Barnes while she worked out her legal issues. A school district spokesperson further clarified that state and federal background checks came back clear at the time of her hiring and that administration officials were unaware of the warrant. 10. Daniel Ahrens when a Yelper wrote a pair of scathing reviews about his business in October 2022, the owner of a Tampa Bay Area restaurant called Georgia Boys Barbecue didn't take it too well. Just days after the criticism was posted, 60-year-old Daniel Ahrens allegedly assaulted the dissatisfied diner outside a residence in the city of Largo. According to an arrest report, the victim went to the home to tell his mother that Aarons had threatened him after seeing the negative restaurant reviews. More specifically, the bitter businessman was accused of sending threatening text messages to the victim, calling the man and threatening to beat his ass. Aarons allegedly showed up at the house, shoved past the victim's mother when she answered the door, and then chased the victim into the street. The victim's mother tried to separate the parties, but according to her and the victim, Aarons continued to chase after the victim, who stumbled and fell backward while trying to back away from the enraged restaurant owner. The arrest report slated that when the victim fell, Aarons pounced on top of him and struck him repeatedly while the victim attempted to shield his face and head with his arms. Aarons was charged with suspicion of simple battery, which came on the heels of a prior arrest in an unrelated incident on charges of domestic battery by strangulation, aggravated domestic assault, and criminal mischief. While the outcome of the case is unclear, state records show that nobody by his name is currently incarcerated or under supervision, indicating that the matter was likely squared away without any serious consequences, and his restaurant appears to still be open. 9. Frisky Firefighter In August of 2023, public officials in Detroit, Michigan announced that a city firefighter had been placed on unpaid leave after his explicit on-the-job photos appeared on social media. The investigation began after local news outlet Click on Detroit broke the story about the images, including one that appeared to show the nine-year department veteran kneeling unclothed next to a fire truck. Based on the background in this and other explicit photos, it seemed pretty clear that the snapshots were taken on city property. In one image, the firefighter was naked and showing off his badge, while another showed him in his city uniform with his pants pulled down. 
Other firefighters shared their opinion with the news station, including one who described the accused man's alleged behavior as a disgrace. Others said things like, I can't believe he took those photos and what was he thinking? Shortly after the story made news headlines, Executive Fire Commissioner Charles Sims told a click on Detroit reporter that the matter was under investigation. He said that he didn't want to comment any further until the investigation was over. That day came less than a month later, when the firefighter returned to work despite his apparent violation of the city's social media policy. A spokesperson said that he had no prior disciplinary issues with the department and that authorities were confident that he wouldn't violate policy moving forward. One can only imagine the embarrassment he likely faced upon returning to work was probably enough of a lesson for him to never repeat his past mistakes. 8. James Burke In December of 2015, former Suffolk County, New York Police Chief James Burke was arrested at his home by federal agents for a crime he'd committed three years earlier. According to authorities, the disgraced Long Islander assaulted and threatened a suspect who was in custody after being arrested on suspicion of theft in 2012. Berg's arrest came several months after a civil lawsuit was filed by 29-year-old Christopher Loeb, who accused the former police chief of chaining him to the floor and beating him for hours. Loeb was suspected of stealing a duffel bag containing ammunition and a gun belt from Berg's unmarked SUV, which was parked in front of the chief's house in St. James. The young man pleaded guilty to the charge and was sentenced to three years in prison, but obviously this didn't make it okay for someone in a position of authority to abuse him. In fact, Loeb claimed that the duffel bag had pornography, adult toys, and other embarrassing items in it, which he believed was Burke's motivation for having a dozen cops swarm his home in an uncharacteristically aggressive fashion when he was apprehended. Following Burke's arrest in 2015, federal authorities revealed that he'd punched and slapped Loeb repeatedly. According to the New York Post, Berg flew into a violent rage when Loeb called him a pervert in reference to the items that he'd found inside the stolen duffel bag. In a statement, the U.S. Justice Department claimed that Berg met with several police officers who witnessed the beating in order to get their story straight. Prosecutors accused him of asking his subordinates to lie on his behalf, including a detective who lied under oath about what had happened. Several of the officers involved in the cover-up eventually agreed to cooperate with the case against Burke, who adamantly denied the allegations and accused Loeb of being a lying, two-time felon and admitted heroin dealer. But his assertions of innocence didn't hold up in court, and by the end of the case, Burke's tone had changed from accusatory to remorseful. As part of a plea deal, he pleaded guilty to violating Loeb's civil rights and conspiracy to obstruct justice and was sentenced to just under three years in federal prison. At his sentencing, Berg apologized to the community, the police, the judge, and to Loeb, who looked the former police chief straight in the eye and delivered a compelling victim impact statement. In his own words, Loeb said, You abused your power, and I will never again feel safe living in Suffolk County. Sadly, the story didn't seem to end well for anyone involved. After serving his time for the duffel bag theft and being released from prison in 2017, Loeb seemed grateful for his freedom and intent on turning over a new leaf. But he landed back in hot water with the law in March 2019, when he was accused of deliberately ramming the vehicle into a police car twice during a high-speed chase. He was arrested on a slew of charges, including criminal mischief, reckless endangerment, driving while impaired by drugs, and more. But once again, Loeb accused the police of beating him during the incident. While the outcome of the case is unclear, records show that he's not currently incarcerated in the state prison system. Later that year, former Suffolk County District Attorney Tom Spoter and his chief investigator, Christopher McPartland, were found guilty of participating in the cover-up of Loeb's beating back in 2012. In 2021, the 79-year-old ex-prosecutor and his 53-year-old top aide were each sentenced to five years in federal prison for their roles in the scheme. But the scandal doesn't end there. In August 2023, Burke was arrested for allegedly soliciting intimacy from an undercover ranger at a public park at Vietnam Veterans Memorial Park in Farmingville. 
According to an arrest report obtained by the Associated Press, the former police chief allegedly exposed himself to the undercover ranger and described the specific act he was interested in. The accusations certainly go against Berg's previous claims that he planned to serve his prison time and return to being a respectable and productive member of society. But the case appears to be ongoing, which means that he remains innocent until proven guilty. 7. Ricky Lee Adami In June of 2018, a 55-year-old pizzeria worker in Fayetteville, North Carolina, named Ricky Lee Adami, allegedly mixed rat poison with grated cheese that was meant for making pizzas that would be served to customers. Nobody ended up consuming the poison thanks to the restaurant's manager, Guru Baisa, who noticed that the substance had been sprinkled into the cheese when he was preparing pizzas. While reviewing the business's surveillance footage, Baisa reportedly saw Adami repeatedly reaching into his pocket and sprinkling the poison into a cheese shredding machine several times. Speaking with local station WSOC-TV, he later said that he was breaking up the cheese to make it easier to spread and immediately noticed the foreign substance. Spicer also told the news outlet that Adami had been behaving bizarrely, but he was at a loss to speculate on the pizza chef's possible motive for poisoning the restaurant's food. Adami was charged with distributing food injurious to health, and of course he lost his job in light of the incident. While news outlets failed to follow up on the case, state records show that he was convicted of the charge. He served a combination of prison time and parole totaling nearly two years. He appears to have completed his sentence, but his current activities and whereabouts are unknown. 6. Christopher Olmstead A shocking number of people showed their disturbing true colors during the COVID-19 pandemic, when the US government and a multitude of private organizations made it a lot easier to access emergency funds. One such individual was 36-year-old schoolteacher Christopher Olmstead, who was accused of conspiring with several colleagues in a scheme to steal $154,000 in pandemic funding for teachers. In 2020, Olmstead was named Teacher of the Year at the Las Vegas Charter School where he worked. But not long after that, he made at least 21 fraudulent accounts on a donor website, which provided $954 grants to teachers for projects. The phony applications were approved by the school's principal, Victoria Welling. According to prosecutors, only 50 teachers at the school were eligible to receive the grant money, yet more than 169 grant applications were uncovered during the investigation into the suspected theft. The ill-gotten funds were used to buy numerous items, including six Nintendo Switches, two drones, and an Apple TV. During a search of one teacher's home, investigators found iPads, Power Ranger figurines and other toys, televisions, kitchenware, and other items that were bought using the stolen grant money. The suspects used the items for the school students, and there was no evidence that he personally benefited from the theft. Surveillance footage proved that the items were used by the students, but the money was nevertheless obtained fraudulently, and the scheme's participants were criminally charged for their actions. Ironically, the same video was instrumental in proving the case against Olmsted, Welling, and another teacher, Andrea Fuentes Soto. In late 2023, Olmsted pleaded guilty to felony theft and was sentenced to two years of probation. Welling took a plea offer and was sentenced to probation for misdemeanor theft. Fuentes Soto, who created at least 16 fraudulent accounts, pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor theft charge and was sentenced to two years of probation. She didn't apologize during her sentencing hearing and declined to comment when asked if she had anything to say. And this probably goes without saying, but all three defendants lost their jobs. 5. Maria Furman When a parent hires a nanny for their children, they usually do a fair amount of research before trusting someone to enter their home and care for their family. But bad people still manage to slip through the cracks, even after being vetted at least somewhat thoroughly. In one ongoing case that made news headlines in December 2023, a 25-year-old Stanford, Pennsylvania woman named Maria Furman stands accused of stealing valuables and cash from a local family while working as a nanny. 
According to police, the family started to suspect Furman of stealing from them when they noticed things going missing without explanation. And their suspicions were only heightened when they found social media photos of Furman wearing items that were identical to the valuables that had disappeared. By the time the family cut ties with Furman, over $25,000 worth of belongings had disappeared from their home, including a tennis bracelet, a purse, an expensive camera lens, and $15,000 cash. Fairfield County financial crimes investigator Vanessa Lip managed to track the stolen items to a local pawn shop where Furman allegedly sold the tennis bracelet. The former nanny is now facing larceny and attempted larceny charges. Thurman reportedly admitted to some of the allegations during questioning, but she came to the police station the next day on her own accord and gave a full confession. She remains free on a $50,000 bond, pending the outcome of her case. 4. John Pollard In December of 2023, an Arkansas police chief landed in the very place he was used to putting people in – jail. According to state authorities, 52-year-old John Pollard stole over $73,000 in public funds while serving as the top cop in the small city of Kensett. He allegedly received payroll overpayments of roughly $66,000 over a three-year period starting in 2021 and failed to file confiscation reports for over $7,000 that the department dispersed or received in controlled drug buys. Based on the findings of an audit, Pollard's payroll discrepancies included unapproved records, salary payments that exceeded budgeted amounts, unauthorized vacation pay, and excessive holiday compensation. Pollard is also suspected of having something to do with six guns that vanished from the evidence room during the same period, as well as $6,700 in seized currency that went missing in 2020. The disgraced former lawman was charged with felony counts of abuse of office and theft of $25,000 or more. If convicted, he could face a maximum punishment of 5 to 20 years in state prison on each charge. It's likely safe to assume that his law enforcement career is over with anyway, but he'll probably suffer other consequences if he's found guilty, including a fine of up to $15,000 for each count and a ban from working as a police officer and carrying a gun. Speaking with local news station KARK, locals expressed shock and disappointment at the news of Pollard's arrest. Lifelong resident Don Fuller said that he didn't think anything would come of it when he first heard that Pollard was being investigated in February 2023. But much to his surprise, Pollard was fired shortly thereafter, and the criminal charges came eight months later. Following his arrest, Pollard was released on a $100,000 bond, and as of January 2024, his case is ongoing. 3. Pregnant Prison Guards In 2013, more than three dozen employees and inmates at the infamous Baltimore City Detention Center were federally charged with smuggling drugs and other contraband into the facility in cooperation with incarcerated members of the Black Gorilla family gang. More specifically, 13 female corrections officers, seven inmates, and five civilian co-conspirators were hit with charges of racketeering, money laundering, and possession with intent to distribute. According to an affidavit, the accused employees made thousands of dollars smuggling drugs, prescription pills, cigarettes, and cell phones into the jail as part of a sophisticated and long-running operation in collaboration with the gang. They reportedly snuck the contraband into the jail by hiding it in their shoes because the facility didn't require employees to remove their shoes upon entering the building. The correction officers were instrumental in enabling the incarcerated gang members to continue running the criminal enterprise from behind bars. Inmate Tavon White had his accomplices wrapped around his finger, to the point that he made as much as $16,000 per month as the operation's ringleader. He also impregnated four corrections officers during the four years he spent in pre-trial detention at the jail, and two of the women had his name tattooed on their bodies. The guards, Jennifer Owens, Katara Stevenson, Chania Brooks, and Tiffany Linda, were among those charged in the scheme. In early 2015, White pleaded guilty to a federal racketeering charge and a state charge of attempted murder. He's serving concurrent sentences of 12 years in prison, 
followed by three years of supervised release in the federal case and 20 years for the state case. Out of the 44 individuals who were ultimately arrested in connection with the smuggling operations, at least 40 were convicted, including 24 corrections officers, many of whom served prison time for their roles in the illicit scheme. After housing prisoners for more than a century, the notorious jail was shut down following the scandal. Demolition on the building began in 2019, and it was completed in 2021. 2. Matthew Soccer In one of the more bizarre cases to make today's list, which of course comes out of Florida, a crisis intervention teacher named Matthew Soccer resigned from his job in October 2023 after pleading guilty to stealing money from a high school student. According to news reports, the 51-year-old allegedly entered a locker room and stole $60 in cash from a teenager's book bag while the student was in gym class. Soccer was arrested on misdemeanor petty theft after the student noticed money missing from his backpack on three separate occasions and planted a hidden camera in order to catch the thief. One can only imagine how surprised he was when he discovered that the culprit wasn't a fellow student but one of the school's teachers. According to an incident report, the footage showed Soccer rifling through multiple students' backpacks on several different days. When confronted with the video, Soccer allegedly admitted to stealing the money and confessed that he'd been going through students' belongings for a long time. He reportedly claimed that he did it because he didn't have gas in his car, had left his wallet at home, and felt too ashamed to borrow money from his colleagues or superiors. Soccer pleaded guilty to the charge and was sentenced to six months of probation and 15 hours of community service. He was also ordered to take a theft abatement course and quit his job as a hearing over whether to fire him approached. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. 1. Amy McSwain In the grand scheme of things, a budgeting discrepancy of a few hundred dollars may not seem like a big deal to some people. But one keen-eyed parent in Hardin County, Tennessee became suspicious when they noticed that a check they'd written to a high school teacher for their child's supply and locker fees hadn't cleared from their bank account. The mother contacted the school to find out why the money hadn't been deposited, prompting an investigation into the student's teacher, Amy McSwain, who promised that she'd look into the missing funds. While attempting to get to the bottom of the situation, officials reportedly noticed that McSwain hadn't completed her official collection locks. She'd also allegedly failed to turn collection money into the school's bookkeeper. Investigators searched McSwain's classroom and found her assigned money bag behind a filing cabinet next to her personal belongings. And inside the bag were six checks for student fees totaling $180. After taking a look at the numbers, $370 in cash turned up missing. According to state authorities, McSwain admitted that she hadn't given the checks to the bookkeeper. She reportedly had no explanation for the missing cash, but offered to repay the funds. Furthermore, school officials were accused of failing to ensure that the money was deposited within a three-day period as required. Following the investigation, McSwain resigned from her teaching position. In July 2023, she was indicted on theft and official misconduct charges. The case appears to be ongoing. Number 14. Savannah Henderson In the United States, prostitution is only legal in a small handful of counties in Nevada. Located within this region is the world-famous Moonlight Bunny Ranch, which has been open for business for decades since 1955. For the most part, it's a safe place for members of the world's oldest profession to carry out their work in peace. But no business is immune to crime, and in early 2023, a fight between two employees led to shots being fired. While responding to the property right outside Carson City, police heard heavy gunfire. They quickly evacuated the building as the employee accused of firing the gunshots retreated to her room and refused to come outside. A three-hour standoff between crisis negotiators and the suspect, 28-year-old Savannah Henderson, kicked off. Eventually, the woman surrendered. Luckily, nobody was injured in the attack. Henderson was initially charged with four counts of being a felon in possession of a weapon, one count each of drug possession, discharging a weapon, and obstructing resisting a peace officer. 
She paid $86,000 in bail money and quickly went onto social media after her release from jail. In a series of tweets, Henderson insisted police got the wrong person and said her booking numbers were skyrocketing since the incident. Eight days after the shooting, she announced that her charges had been dropped altogether. Number 13. Jesus Asensio Molina During an interview with an Oregon-based news station called KATU in 2018, Ruben Lopez remembered hearing a heated argument from down the street while doing some work on a house in Happy Valley, Oregon. A few minutes later, a medical helicopter came and picked a person up at the property. It turned out a construction worker at an unfinished house nearby had actually attacked his co-worker, Andres Marcelo, with a nail gun, resulting in life-threatening injuries. The victim's brother-in-law, who saw the incident, told KATU that the attack happened without any warning at all. He accused the suspect, 24-year-old Jesus Asensio Molina, of repeatedly firing nails into the victim for no reason. Some of the nails struck him right in the head, but he was reportedly still conscious when taken to the hospital. Luckily, he survived the ordeal. Molina fled the scene and was arrested the next morning during a police manhunt. He was charged with attempted murder, but the case fell off the news radar shortly after it first broke, and the outcome is now unclear. According to authorities, Molina had been deported from the United States six years before. Immigration and Customs Enforcement issued a request for Oregon authorities to notify them before letting him go. Records show that he's no longer in local custody, but Clackamas County's policy of non-cooperation most likely means that ICE was never properly informed. Number 12. Viral McDonald's Brawl In a TikTok that went viral back in November 2022, two McDonald's employees were seen facing off with one another while holding restaurant equipment in their hands. The clip showed a female worker grabbing one of the metal baskets used for deep-frying food, while another picked up a heavy metal trash can. They stood facing each other and yelling profanities while a third employee, who was filming, stood by and watched. The footage was posted by a user named Renee under the handle at forever.christy. In a follow-up video not long after that night, she said that her cousin, who apparently worked at the restaurant, became frustrated after having to repeatedly fix orders that were being put into the computer system incorrectly. After her anger reached a boiling point, Renee's cousin asked the employee at the register what their problem was. The counter worker responded aggressively, and the fight almost became physical. Thankfully, it didn't, and no one was hurt. Number 11. Craig Armstead In 2006, Kerry Harris moved from Memphis to Atlanta to start a new, promising job as a quality assurance manager at the Cargill Food Company. As one of the largest privately held corporations in the entire U.S., the company offered her a competitive salary and the potential for future growth, so Kerry looked forward to the many opportunities that came with the job. She quickly became well-known among her co-workers as polite and professional, keeping her personal and work lives entirely separate from one another and staying far away from workplace drama. And while most people respected Kerry's desire for privacy, an employee named Craig Armstead seemed overly eager to connect with her. During her first days on the job, he gave her a welcome cake. At first, Kerry wrote Armstead's gesture off as strange but kind. She thanked him for the cake and thought nothing else of it. Kerry soon started to notice that someone was going into her office and moving things around when she wasn't inside. She didn't know who exactly was doing it, but even stranger things began happening over time. One time, she had unexplainable car trouble in the parking lot at work. Of course, Armstead magically showed up and knew exactly how to get the car to start. Sometimes, Kerry felt like she was being followed on her drive home. One night, it became clear that someone was actually trailing her. She couldn't tell who it was, so she became terrified. The car finally stopped pursuing her when she pulled into the parking lot of a police station. Over the next few months, Armstead continued to give Kerry flowers and inappropriate gifts, which she politely refused. She told Armstead she didn't date her co-workers, but he kept up the act. Kerry eventually had to report the man to management. Armstead received a written warning and was told not to speak with her unless it was work-related. After doing a little bit of digging, Kerry's friend found out that Armstead had served five years in prison back in the 90s 
for killing his girlfriend. The discovery deeply worried Kerry, but she continued going to work and focusing on her job, hoping Armstead would just leave her alone. Two years after starting with Cargill, she received a promotion, and perhaps not surprisingly, Armstead congratulated her with an expensive digital organizer. Kerry once again turned down his gift. Not long after that, she and a co-worker found a hidden camera in the woman's bathroom. She took the camera to Human Resources, who later determined that it belonged to Armstead and that it had over a thousand hours of perverted footage on it. Since it was still recording when Kerry turned it in, Armstead knew she was the one who found it. A few hours later, he brutally stabbed Kerry to death in her office and left the scene. He was quickly arrested. Just like his previous case for killing his girlfriend, Armstead tried to plead insanity, claiming that an evil voice in his head told him to kill Kerry. But the court didn't buy it at all, and he was convicted of murder, aggravated assault, and a weapon charge, along with 18 counts of unlawful eavesdropping and surveillance for the videos on the hidden camera. Armstead was sentenced to life plus 60 years for what he did. Number 10. Amy Bishop on what seemed like a normal day in 2010, police responded to a call in Huntsville about a shooting at the University of Alabama. Officers arrived and found a horrifying scene in a meeting room where three staff members were dead from gunshot wounds. They were discovered along with several other employees, including two who were seriously injured. According to witnesses, a biology professor named Amy Bishop stood up and started shooting at her colleagues during a meeting. She acted normal for the first 30 to 40 minutes of the gathering before suddenly pulling out a Ruger handgun and opening fire out of nowhere. To those who live to tell their story of what happened, it was clear that this was no random act of violence. Bishop pointed and fired at her co-workers in a deliberate manner, carrying out what seemed to be a planned workplace massacre. Thankfully, her gun jammed before she could kill everyone in sight. As Bishop struggled with the firearm, survivors rushed to push her out of the room and block her from coming back in. Police took her into custody within a few minutes after getting to the scene. Bishop's victims were all extremely well-liked members of the academic community. People nobody could ever imagine someone wanting dead. The shooting happened after Bishop failed to reach tenure status at the university, where she had hoped to land a permanent position. She appealed the decision multiple times and was denied time and time again. Shortly before the shooting, she had lost another appeal. The victims had all actually supported Bishop's bid for tenure, but she apparently hated all her colleagues equally at that point and resented their tenure statuses. She had an alarming history of violent outbursts pointing toward many deadly anger issues. In 1986, she fatally shot her brother during a fight, but avoided charges after the family convinced police it was all a huge accident. In 1994, Bishop and her husband were suspected of mailing pipe bombs to her former lab supervisor at Harvard, where she earned her PhD. This was supposedly revenge, for giving her a bad review. Eight years later, she was arrested for assaulting a woman at a restaurant where the victim had taken the last available booster seat for her kid. Bishop demanded that the woman hand over the seat, which she wanted to use for one of her four children. When the victim refused, Bishop slugged her right in the face. Her past showed a clear pattern of arrogance, aggression, and terrible reactions when she didn't get her way. She initially tried pleading insanity, but ultimately pleaded guilty and was ordered to serve life in prison without parole opportunities. Number 9. Robert Peterson After going through a bitter divorce in the early 2000s, Gene Thurnor moved all the way from Nebraska to Land Lakes, Florida, where he took a job as an air traffic controller at the St. Pete Clearwater Airport. A few years later, he married one of his co-workers, Juanita, and the couple decided to build a brand new house. Their future looked bright, but an unexpected tragedy struck them in 2006. Shortly after moving into their new home, the couple's co-worker, Robert Peterson, said he was going to stop by with a housewarming gift. He gave the couple a photo album filled with pictures detailing a week-by-week -week progression of the construction of their house. It was a thoughtful but strange gift, considering Jean and Juanita were unaware Peterson had ever even been to their house. During the visit, Juanita had to leave and run a few errands. When she came home, she found a trail of blood leading to a pile of her husband's bloody clothes. 
Jean was soon discovered murdered and mutilated at Peterson's home, where Peterson was also found dead. Based on the evidence they found, police concluded that Peterson had shot Jean before deciding to take his own life. An investigation followed, revealing disturbing evidence of a long-standing obsession that eventually drove Peterson to kill. Peterson and Jean met while working together as air traffic controllers in Nebraska. During that time, Peterson showed a somewhat odd interest in befriending Jean and had even asked if he could buy one of Jean's dogs after seeing a photo of them. After transferring to Florida, Jean received a photo of his old apartment in the mail from Peterson, along with a handwritten message basically saying, do you see what you left behind? Jean interpreted the letter as a snarky complaint about leaving the Nebraska location understaffed and didn't think much else of it. Three months after Jean moved to Florida, Peterson transferred to the same airport. Jean initially wrote his co-worker off as eccentric. He also assumed Peterson had his own reasons for moving to the state and chalked it up to a big coincidence. When Jean and Juanita started dating, they kept their relationship on the low at their job. Peterson discovered the relationship, and the only way he could have realized the two were a couple was by following them or seeing them out together by coincidence. The latter was unlikely. After the couple married and made plans to move into their newly built home, Peterson offered to buy Jean's old house. Despite the disturbingly clingy behavior, the Thurnors were still friendly toward Peterson, writing him off as an odd loner with annoying but harmless tendencies. As it turned out, Peterson had been secretly spying on the Thurnors more than they realized. In fact, he was straight up stalking them, driven by an obsession that bordered a romantic fantasy. His feelings were detailed in a three-page handwritten note that Juanita found after the murder. In the letter, Peterson said he had been in love with Jean for many years. He also wrote that he was not going to leave Jean's house until certain intimate acts had happened. Based on the letter alone, it's safe to assume that Jean resisted Peterson's unwanted advances, causing his creepy co-worker to finally snap. Sadly, instead of recognizing his need for mental help, Peterson took extreme measures, forcing Jean to pay with his life and leaving behind a trail of devastation for his loved ones. Number 8. Daniel Edwards Known for her gentle and sweet personality, a 60-year-old horse trainer and farmhand named Fiona Southwell was liked by basically everyone she met. Yet in 2017, someone hated her enough to stab her to death in an uncontrolled fit of rage. Fiona's lifeless body was discovered in a barn at her workplace in northern England, where her killer had violently ambushed her. She had at least 19 stab wounds and multiple defensive wounds, which showed that she fought desperately for her life during her last few moments. The people in Fiona's life found it unimaginable that someone could have wanted her dead, but she unknowingly made an enemy several months earlier when she was hired at her job to replace a troubled farmhand named Daniel Edwards. The farm owners fired Edwards for having a poor attendance record, but he ultimately blamed Fiona for being terminated. He made several creepy posts on social media leading up to the attack, including one stating that he was going to let his demons out to play soon. It was clear, based on Edward's Facebook posts alone, that he saw himself as a victim and wanted revenge. One of the saddest aspects of Fiona's murder is that she was planning on leaving the job soon and moving to southern England to start a new chapter in life. Sadly, she never even got the chance. Edward suffered from multiple intellectual setbacks that limited his career prospects. He also allegedly had substance abuse problems and lacked a stable home environment. But personal struggles are no excuse for killing someone, and after finding evidence connecting him to the crime, police charged him accordingly. A jury later convicted Edwards of murder, which comes with an automatic life sentence in Britain. But judges were allowed to impose a minimum sentence, which means that many convicts see freedom again. Edwards' lawyer practically begged the judge to consider Edwards' developmental issues in deciding his sentence, noting that his client had the mental capabilities of a nine-year-old. After weighing it against the gruesome and unprovoked nature of the crime, the judge sentenced Edwards to a 24-year minimum. Number 7. Michael Stark 50-year-old Matthew Branning mysteriously vanished in 2021 after he failed to come home from his shift at a manufacturing company in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. 
He was never located, but authorities believe he was killed by his co-worker, Michael Stark. The man was charged with the crime in 2023. According to the district attorney's office, Stark failed to show up to work on the day of Branning's disappearance. Toward the end of the victim's shift, he allegedly called an Uber and got dropped off at the job site where he waited for the victim to leave. He then kidnapped Branning and forced him to take him to a drive through ATM, where surveillance footage captured Branning withdrawing large amounts of money. In the video, nobody seemed to be in the front passenger seat, but prosecutors claim that a person was partially visible in the back seat. Law enforcement tracked Branning's SUV to parts of central and southern New Jersey. At the same time the vehicle was at a gas station in Cape May, Stark was seen on the store's security cameras. Branning was nowhere to be seen. At some point during these travels, investigators believe Stark killed Branning and got rid of his body. The SUV was eventually found in Virginia. Inside, police saw several drug vials that they do not think belonged to Branning, who was a well-known family man who lived a healthy and law-abiding lifestyle. They believe he was targeted by Stark since he was known to carry large amounts of cash. It's rare for prosecutors to pursue a case without a body, but after two years of searching while other evidence stacked up, they believe they had a strong enough case to secure a conviction. Stark is currently being held without bail on murder and kidnapping charges while he awaits the next steps in his case. Number 6. Antoinette Martinez and Camio Kleins one morning back in 2014, a rancher spotted the murdered body of a young man on his property in Becker County, Texas. The victim had been shot multiple times and tied up with tape. Based on the evidence found at the scene, police theorized that the victim was abducted and driven to the property. He was shot in the back and passed away face down, indicating that he made a last-ditch effort to escape his killer. Investigators found no cell phone, wallet, or ID near his remains, pointing toward robbery as the most likely motive for the crime. The victim was later identified as 20-year-old Xavier Cordero, who had recently been reported missing by a few of his co-workers. By all accounts, he was an ordinary young man who typically stayed out of trouble. His girlfriend told police that Xavier had left in his car to meet someone late at night and simply never came home. The last known person Xavier had phone contact with, his ex-girlfriend Antoinette Martinez, claimed that he was supposed to come see her on the night of the murder, but never actually showed up. Meanwhile, another young man, Stephen Rendon, went missing and was discovered bound and murdered under suspiciously similar circumstances. Everything started coming together when an aggravated robbery suspect named Cameo Kleins was seen running to Antoinette's apartment. After arresting Cameo, police searched the home and found both Xavier and Stephen's IDs, along with the gun that killed both victims. Realizing the gig was up, Antoinette decided to come clean to law enforcement. Antoinette and Cameo were co-workers at a restaurant who bonded over a shared resentment of their boss, their low wages, and lack of overtime pay. Instead of asking for a raise, they decided to take the money they believed was owed to them. In the first of what turned out to be multiple robberies, Cameo held up the restaurant while Antoinette was still working. She posed as a victim, and they shared in the proceeds afterwards. Not long after that, Antoinette lured Xavier Cordero over to her apartment. He came over and started to undress, thinking they were about to mess around, when Cameo suddenly entered the room and ordered him to hand over his money and valuables. Xavier refused to cooperate. What was meant to be a robbery soon escalated to kidnapping and murder. After realizing that Xavier didn't have as much money on him as they thought he would, Antoinette and Cameo decided to strike again. This time, Antoinette posted a couple of photos online, along with an invitation for men who were looking for a fun time. Stephen Rendon took the bait and became their next victim. Once in custody, the co-workers each claimed they were under the other's spell when they carried out the murders, but footage of the two suspects talking at the police station, unaware that they were being filmed, showed that they both had an equal hand in the crimes. Even more disturbing was the fact that they could be seen laughing and joking about what they'd done. Cameo took a plea deal and admitted to murder in exchange for two life sentences, and the possibility of parole. Antoinette took her chances on a trial and was found guilty of capital murder. She's now serving life without parole. Number 5. Connor Sturgeon 
One morning in 2023, the day was just starting out for employees at an old National Bank location in Louisville, Kentucky, when one of their co-workers opened fire without warning. Using an AR-15 he had bought just days earlier, 25-year-old Connor Sturgeon killed five people and injured eight others, including a responding police officer who survived after being shot directly in the head. Sturgeon was fatally wounded while exchanging gunfire with law enforcement. After finding his phone in his pocket, police realized he had actually live-streamed the shooting on social media. Although he had a long history of depression, many of those who knew Sturgeon were completely shocked by his actions. Described by a former bank manager as low-key and relaxed, his personality didn't match the image of a mass shooter. But the signs were there, and unfortunately in some cases, they were overlooked. A search of his phone and apartment building revealed that Sturgeon had confided in a friend leading up to the crime, stating that he felt suicidal and wanted to kill people. In his last social media post, he wrote, They won't listen to words or protests. Let's see if they hear this. Police discovered notes on Sturgeon's body stating that one of his goals was to prove how easy it is for a mentally ill person to get a gun in the United States. Law enforcement also reportedly found messages on his phone outlining his plans to commit the massacre. The investigation is still ongoing. So far, authorities have released very limited details about their findings. And while some information about what was going on in Sturgeon's mind has been revealed, the full reasoning behind the slaughter is unclear. Number 4. Christopher Gregory and Jennifer Walter 18-year-old Christy Robbins got pregnant straight out of high school in 1998. About a year after giving birth, Christy broke up with her baby daddy Christopher Gregory, got custody of their son, and moved back into her parents' house in Beaumont, Texas. She tried to stay civil for their child's sake, even when Christopher fell behind on child support payments and challenged their custody arrangement in family court. Christopher soon started dating Jennifer Walter, a dancer at the strip club he worked at as a cook and a bouncer. She struggled with addiction and money issues and had two kids of her own that she did not have custody over. When Christopher saw Jennifer starting to spiral out of control, he took her into his home and made attempts to help her straighten her life out. On one of Christopher's scheduled weekends with his baby in 1999, Christy told her parents she was going out with her new boyfriend that night and not to wait up for her. The next morning, law enforcement showed up at the family's and told them that Christy was dead. A deputy found her car and body engulfed in flames. The remains were charred beyond recognition and authorities suspected she was murdered. Christopher seemed shocked and was extremely cooperative. He claimed he was at home with Jennifer that night. When police noticed some suspicious scratches on his chest, the couple claimed it was from getting too rough in the bedroom. During individual questioning, Christopher revealed that Christy planned to pick up their son that night, but never showed up. He showed interrogators his phone log, which listed three calls to the victim. Christy's boyfriend told investigators that he and Christy planned to spend the night together, but that she cut things short after getting into some heated phone calls. Her phone record showed not three, but 12 phone calls between her and Christopher that night. A search of Christopher and Jennifer's apartment revealed a huge blood stain, which matched Christy. At that point, Christopher tried to play innocent. He threw Jennifer under the bus by blaming her for Christy's murder claiming that she had a problem with Christy still being part of their lives. Outraged that Christopher tried to blame her, Jennifer came clean. She said her lover had developed an obsessive rage over his custody battle with Christy. He started talking about wanting to get rid of his child's mother. At first, Jennifer didn't think he was being serious. She realized she was wrong when Christopher lured Christy to their apartment the night of the murder. Jennifer admitted that she helped Christopher kill his member and get rid of the body. It was soon discovered that the police had pulled the couple over for a traffic violation on their way home from parking Christy's SUV and setting it on fire, proving that Christopher was involved despite his constant claims of innocence. After pointing the finger at one another for months, Jennifer and Christopher both pleaded guilty to murder and were sentenced to 45 and 50 years in prison. Number 3. Brittany Norwood One morning in 2011, the manager of a Lululemon in Bethesda, Maryland, found the store in complete disarray. In a back room, employee Jana Murray was lying face down on the floor in a pool of blood, with something around her neck. Brittany Norwood, who had closed the store with Murray the night before, 
was in a nearby bathroom with her hands and feet tied up with zip ties and blood splattered on her face. She seemed to be semi-conscious and was soon in good enough shape to speak with the police. According to Norwood's version of events, she called Murray on the phone a few minutes after closing the store and said she forgot her wallet inside. The two women met up and went back inside together so she could grab it. While they were there, two men in ski masks entered the store and attacked them. After initially treating Norwood as a victim, police eventually started to doubt her version of events. While Murray was attacked viciously, Norwood's injuries were minor and seemed self-inflicted, and the store appeared to be staged to look ransacked. Forensic experts were able to prove that the crime scene did not match up with Norwood's story. Employees at an Apple store next to the Lululemon told police that they overheard a fight between two women on the night of Murray's murder, pointing toward Norwood lying about what really happened. Unfortunately, the Apple employees wrote the noise off as typical drama and didn't call authorities or pursue the situation any further. Three blocks away from the crime scene, law enforcement located Murray's car. Inside, they found a mixture of her and Norwood's blood. Despite the mounting pile of evidence against her, Norwood stuck to her story, claiming that the men who attacked her and Murray ordered her to move her car. She said they let her go by herself and ordered her to come back in 10 minutes or else they would track her down and kill her. At this point, Norwood's story had become completely unbelievable and there was enough evidence to charge her with first-degree murder. At trial, the court heard how Murray caught Norwood trying to steal some leggings while they were closing up the store. After leaving, Murray called the manager to report the discovery. A few minutes later, Norwood called Murray and, as she had already admitted, said that she left her wallet at work. Prosecutors accused Norwood of luring Murray back to the store and killing her, perhaps thinking it would stop the victim from reporting the theft. She made up the story about the masked intruders, hoping to fool the police and continue her life as usual. She was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Number 2. Brian Cooper At just 21 years old, Alicia Bromfield was a college student with a full-time job and a baby already on the way. Sadly, the child's father wanted no involvement with the baby. Her plate was full, but she embraced all of life's curveballs and looked forward to her future family. In May 2012, she returned to her summer job at a Home Depot store in Northern Illinois. It wasn't long before her supervisor there, 36-year-old Brian Cooper, made unwanted romantic advances towards her. When Alicia rejected him, Cooper started harassing her, at times calling her names and even throwing things at her in front of other employees. He also told multiple people that Alicia was his girlfriend, which was obviously not true, and threatened to cut her hours or fire her if she didn't follow follow his demands. As a single mother-to-be, it was important for Alicia to keep a steady paycheck coming in, so she hesitated to complain about the abuse at first. But Cooper's behavior eventually became unbearable, so she reported him multiple times to upper management. Sadly, the harassment didn't stop, and Cooper suffered no apparent consequences. In August 2012, he forced Alicia to go to his sister's wedding four hours away in Door County, Wisconsin with him. Knowing how he treated her daughter, Alicia's mom begged her not to go to the event. By then, Alicia was already seven months pregnant, and her loved ones feared not only for her safety, but for the well-being of her unborn child. Sadly, Alicia felt like she had no choice but to attend the wedding. She told her mom she made it clear to Cooper that they were going together as friends. On the morning of the wedding, Alicia contacted her mom again and said she was on her way home. She and Cooper had gotten into a fight after she realized they weren't staying in the same hotel as the wedding party like he promised, which made her feel extremely unsafe. Cooper talked Alicia into staying for the wedding, but she told him she wanted to go straight home the morning after and that they were no longer friends. After returning to their hotel room for the night, Cooper tried making plans with Alicia to watch a movie together the next day. She reminded him that she wanted nothing to do with him, and he flew into an unhinged rage. Cooper strangled Alicia to death. Several hours later, he called 911 using a gas station telephone and reported that he had killed the young woman. He fully admitted that the crime was intentional, but argued at trial that he was too drunk to have acted with intent. During the proceedings, the court heard about how Cooper had been spying on Alicia way more than she knew by filming her in the bathroom at the hotel they were staying at for the wedding. 
The first trial ended with a hung jury. A jury convicted Cooper on all charges during a second trial, including the murder of Alicia and her baby, and he received two life sentences without parole. Number 1. Christopher O'Crowley In 2015, a 24-year-old woman named Caroline Nozel became the assistant produce manager at a grocery store in Madison, Wisconsin. She was known for her bubbly personality, was extremely well-liked among her co-workers, and often went out of her way to make new workers feel welcome to the store. She even befriended Christopher O'Crowley, a meat department employee who was friendly but tended to keep to himself. He gave off strange vibes to some of his co-workers. As Caroline got to know Christopher better, she learned that his life wasn't going that well. He had recently gone through a bad breakup, was homeless for a short period of time, and had a child he didn't get to see. Christopher also didn't have a solid support network. Being the caring person that she was, Caroline offered to be there for her co-worker when he needed her. Other employees were scared that Caroline's kind nature would somehow backfire on her. They had a bad feeling about Chris, and rumors soon started to fly about him flirting with a woman who was way too young for him. Even after being branded as a creep, Caroline was willing to give her new friend the benefit of the doubt. A few weeks later, she had too much to drink during an outing with her work friends. When she asked to be taken home, Chris quickly volunteered for the task. But he wasn't sure where Caroline lived, so he took her to his place instead. The next morning, Caroline couldn't shake the suspicion that Chris may have come onto her when she was drunk the night before. She had no romantic interest in him at all, and it began to dawn on her that he may have misinterpreted her soft spot for him as romantic intentions. Realizing her co-workers were right about something being off, she slowly started to distance herself from Chris. At the same time, he began to cling on to Caroline. He texted her non-stop and hung around her constantly while at work. After initially feeling bad for her socially awkward colleague, Caroline felt overwhelmed and unsafe. She stopped responding to the constant barrage of text messages and tried to avoid Chris at work, but he became obsessive. She finally put her foot down and told Chris to stop smothering her, but that failed to make the harassment stop. Soon, he targeted her friends at work. He was fired in early 2016 after Caroline reported him for inappropriate interactions with a younger female co-worker at the store. On top of already being angry that Caroline had stopped talking to him, Chris blamed her for being terminated. Shortly after being fired, he shot Caroline in the chest three times as she left work one night. She died from her injuries, and Chris was sentenced to 40 years to life in prison. In 2017, less than a year into his prison sentence, he was discovered dead in his cell. While some might say he managed to escape justice, the most important thing is that he's no longer a danger to society. If you witnessed a high-ranking superior stealing at your workplace, but you weren't sure if anyone would believe you, would you report them and risk losing your job or keep your mouth shut and try to forget that you saw anything? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.